Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to Union Center Church of the Brethren. We're excited that you're here with us today. Again, whether you're here in person, watching on YouTube a little bit later, or sharing at Greencroft on Thursdays, welcome. Hope we sense God's spirit and presence as we go throughout our worship time this day. At this time, we'll be led by a song that will be on the screen from our worship team. Humbly we come before you, God who reigns, God above all, and pray that you will dwell in our midst this morning as we gather to praise you and to pray to you. Strengthen us through your Holy Spirit that we may witness to you this coming week in word and action. May this service of worship serve as an inspiration to us as disciples. Bless us as we approach and bless us as we depart. This we pray in your name. Amen. Wow, this is a time for our children's story, and I would like to invite any children present to 
Come join me. Hi there, welcome. Well, I'm holding in my hands a Bible. Uh, and the Bible is where we learn the Word of God. I know a poem about when we open our Bible. I like your necklace. That looks good. And it goes like this. This is the Bible. We'll open it wide. There are many stories of people inside. Big people, little people, like me and you. We'll listen carefully to hear what they do. Well, today I'll be talking about a verse from the Bible that says we should pray for our leaders. It means praying to God that we ask God to help them. Of course, sometimes we wonder if our leaders know what it's like to be like us. Well, kids have leaders too. They're called parents. Parents decide what it is we can do, and parents decide what we can't do. Now, being a kid is a fun thing to be. There's so much to do. There's so many games to play, and you also get stickers when you're a kid, right? Yeah. Now, guess who used to be kids? Your parents. They used to be kids just like you, and they remember the fun things that, you, that went with being kids, and they remember the things that weren't as much fun. When they were kids, they thought about what they would be like someday when they were parents. And now they're parents, and they're trying to do those things. It's not easy to be parents. And just as grown-ups are supposed to pray for their leaders, kids are supposed to pray for their parents. How should we do that? Well, here's a little poem about praying for our parents that was written by somebody a long time ago named A. A. Milne. So I'm going to do this little prayer. God bless mommy, I know that's right, and wasn't it fun in the bath tonight? The cold so cold and the hot so hot. God bless daddy, I quite forgot. If I open my eyes just a little bit more, I can see Grandma's dressing gown on the door. It's a beautiful blue, but it hasn't got a hood. God bless Grandma and make her good. <laughs> Mine has a hood and I lie in bed and I pull the hood right over my head and I get inside and I curl up small and nobody knows that I'm there at all. Thank you, God, for a lovely day. And what was the other I wanted to say? I said, bless daddy, so what could it be? Now I remember, God bless me. Well, that, that's a little poem we can pray at nighttime. Yeah, well, anyway, thank you for coming up for Children's Story. You get to go to Sunday school. And have stickers. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Yeah. Our scripture lesson this morning from the Inclusive Bible, we're going to read from 1 Timothy and then also from Daniel. So starting in 1 Timothy, chapter 2. First of all, I urge that prayers be offered for everyone, petitions, intercessions, and thanksgivings, and especially for rulers and those in authority, so that we may be able to live godly and reverent lives in peace and quiet. To do this is right and will please God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to reach full knowledge of the truth. For there's only one God, and there's only one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, who was one of us, and who at the proper time sacrificed himself as a ransom and a testimony for all. Because of this, I have been appointed to be a preacher, an apostle, and, this is the truth now, I'm not lying, a faithful and honest teacher to the Gentiles." And now from Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of the reign of Darius ben Asharis, a Mede by birth who was appointed ruler over the land of the Chaldeans, I, Daniel, was reading the scriptures and pondering the 70 years which, according to the prophet Jeremiah, were to be the length of time that Jerusalem was to be in ruins. 
I turn to the Most High in sackcloth and ashes with heartfelt prayers and petitions. I prayed and made this confession to Yahweh. O great and awesome God, you keep the covenant and have kindness for those who love you and keep the commandments. But we have sinned so much. We have sinned against you. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We have turned away from your ordinances and your commandments and rebelled against you. We haven't obeyed your emissaries, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our rulers, our governors, our ancestors, and all the people of the land. Justice, O God, belongs to you. But to us belongs open shame today. To us, the people of Judah, the citizens of Jerusalem, the whole of Israel, near and far, in every country to which you have dispersed us, because of the treason we have committed against you. O God, open shame belongs to us, to our rulers, to our governors, to our ancestors, because we have sinned against you. Mercy and pardon belong to you, O God, yet we have sinned against you. And you have not listened to your voice, nor followed the laws you have given us, and, and through your faithful prophets. Turn to us, and hear our call. Open your eyes and see how we are in ruins, along with the city that bears your name. Not because of our own virtue, but because we know of your great mercy, we lay our pleas before you. My God, hear us. My God, forgive us. My God, listen and act. For the sake of your name, act swiftly and vindicate the people and city that bear your name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, during, during our time of sharing, we, uh, somebody mentioned the musical Plain and Fancy, uh, the script of which was written by a man named Joseph Stein. Joseph Stein also wrote another little play you may have heard of that we like to call Fiddler on the Roof. In tradition, the opening number of Fiddler on the Roof, Tevia, introduces us to the Jewish community in the little Russian town of Anachevka which is a small Jewish island surrounded by a sea of anti-Semitism. He's especially proud of the town's beloved rabbi, who is, we see emerging from the synagogue, and he's asked this question. Is there a proper blessing for the czar? Well, the young man who asked that question is told, of course, and the rabbi demonstrates that proper blessing. May the Lord bless and keep the czar far away from us. <laughs> Although Paul, the apostle, Paul, who was a Jew from the city of Tarsus, could make his way comfortably throughout the Roman Empire... He also encountered intense anti-Jewish prejudice in the city of Philippi, where he was dragged by a mob to a mock trial, beaten severely, and jailed on false charges of somehow creating a rebellion as a Jew. Before the authorities learned, they have made a really big mistake because Paul is not only a Jew but he's a Roman citizen. After that, they couldn't be nicer, escorting him out of Philippi faster than the munchkins escort Dorothy out of their city once they learn that the wicked witch has it against her. Well, as far as the Roman Empire in the first century is concerned, all Jews, Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, who are the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the followers of Jesus, who in their eyes are just Jews like all the rest of them, they're all atheists. Atheists, you may ask. I thought that Jews and Christians worshiped God. Well, they are considered atheists by the Roman Empire because they don't worship the gods of the Romans, the gods who live on Mount Olympus, who lie, cheat, fight, steal, and scheme with each other and must be placated by sacrifices. 
Gods who you don't so much love as you hope don't notice you. Now, the leader of that faith was the local magistrate, the local governor, or the Roman emperor. And it was the same throughout the ancient world. All the nations God's people came into contact with, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, recognized the emperor or the king as the head of their religion. It was the king who offered the sacrifices, and the priests would then interpret the sacrifice. It was the kings who communicated to God for us. Now, it wasn't the same for the followers of Jesus. We have a mediator, all right, but it's not the government. We don't have to get our request to God channeled through our local representative. That's why Paul says, there is one God, and there is also one mediator between God and humanity, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself as a ransom for all, and this was attested at the right time. That makes it all the more surprising to me that in this passage, the apostle seems to be encouraging us not only to pray for a pagan authority, but an emperor who expects to be worshipped as a god. But he says it. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone and for kings and for all who are in high positions. Well, one thing that's important to notice in this passage is that kings, which, by the way, is the title for the emperor in the eastern part of the empire, Uh, that kings are not listed separately, but part of the everybody for whom we are to pray. (sighs) That's not, they're not part of some separate species, which many people in the ancient world would have believed, that royalty were a different kind of human. God's plan of salvation is for all. The righteousness that Paul speaks of is the condition of finding ourselves exactly where we ought to be, using our unique talents for the work of God with God's people in the midst of all creation and for all creation. That's what righteousness means. When you read Revelation, it's important to notice that when the skies open up and John the Revelator looks into heaven, He only sees the one throne, and there's only one Lord. We see the great masses surrounding our God, praising God in joy. Unlike other faiths where the kings of the world would have a prominent place next to God, in Revelation, the kings of the world are the symbol of evil. And although they do get into heaven, they're latecomers into the new Jerusalem. Only after all the rest of us are in are the doors open and they get to come in at the end of time. The purpose of God's salvation, Paul tells us in this passage, is God desires everyone to be saved and for everyone to come to the knowledge of truth for all. So God not only for some reason, wants to save politicians, but wants them to finally come to the knowledge of truth. That Greek word epigenosis means our rational comprehension of the world, that God made a world that is understandable, and we want them to come around and see things the way they really are. And also acknowledge that there is such a thing as truth, and that truth is not only actual, but will be actualized, that God's truth will come to pass. So the question comes up, how do we, how do we pray for rulers in a fallen world? I mean, for, for at any one point, half of our population is all for praying for our rulers half of the time. We like to quote Romans and other passages when our guy is in 
And then we forget about it conveniently for another four years when the other guy is in. And pretty much everybody does it. How do we pray for rule, fallen rulers in a fallen world? Is it simply by obeying everything they do? Hardly. Christians cannot always obey authority. As Paul notes in his second letter to Timothy, this is his first letter, he says, I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. So being faithful can sometimes have consequences in this world. Well, how do we, we pray for fallen rulers? I think one of the clues comes from the chapter in the book of Daniel, which I had read this morning. In his choice of words, I could talk quite a bit about much of what he prays and, and the need for us uh, to confess our sins. But the big thing about the book of Daniel is it, is it portrays Daniel as a stranger in a strange land, as somebody who is taken away into exile when the temple is destroyed, when Jerusalem falls, and who becomes a civil servant in the court of not just Nebuchadnezzar, but his successor, Balthazar. In the midst of this, Daniel maintains his faithful diet, refuses to bow to an idol, witnesses fearlessly to emperors, and though he serves them faithfully as a civil servant, he maintains his distance from his, uh, their abuses. But the real thing I want you to focus on in that chapter is this. In his prayer of confession before God, when he talks about his history with God's people, he does not say them. He says us. In our prayers of confession before God, we don't need to rail about all the evil that others are doing. We need to recognize that we are part of what is going on, whether we approve it or not. That's one of the reasons we pray for rulers, even those with whom we disagree and even disobey. It's because we are us. When we pray for these rulers, we are praying for us, for the welfare of our family and friends, because we're part of, and here comes a Greek word again, we're part of the same oikonomia. Now, oikonomia is a word from which we not only get our English word economy, the economic tie that ties us all together, but it also means house and household. We are connected politically, economically, and socially with all the people around us. We are family. And that's why an unknown Christian in the second century wrote to a Roman official named Diogenes. Uh, this is what he wrote. This is my translation. I like this passage. For Christians don't come from other countries, speak a different language, or act differently. We, we don't have our own economies or dialect, nor do we have bizarre lifestyles. We live according to chance in both Greek-speaking and foreign cities, rest the same, eat the same foods, act the same in all the rest of life's ways, except that uh, we are also different because of our citizenship. That's because our citizenship is in heaven. We live in the same countries, but we are foreigners. We take part in the political life of our land, but we endure the hardship of being aliens. We live on the earth, but we are citizens of heaven. We are put to death, but we are brought to life. We are made poor, but we make many rich. People curse us, but we bless them in return. Um, simply put, Christians are to the world what the soul is to the body. Christians are to the world what the soul is to the body. Wise words, and we remember, we are the soul of our society. The fourth century Christian preacher Chrysostom, who's by the way, uh, his name meant golden throat because evidently he was a great preacher. He also added about this passage that we read today. No one can feel hatred towards those for whom they pray. Praying for others 
may instill in our hearts at least a glimpse of what God sees or hopes for even the most lost. Nothing is so apt to draw people under their teaching, he goes on to say, as to love and be loved. And if there are sometimes people that are extremely hard to love, it can be the leaders for whom we are called to pray. Now, I can't guarantee that praying for leaders and loving them against all your most basic instincts will work, but I figure it's worth a shot because we need each other. We're in this together. And political leaders, though they don't know it, need us more than we need them because we're called to pray for them. During the Civil War, brethren in the South suffered quite a bit because brethren from their founding were staunchly against slavery, and even though the Civil War was raging, they continued to articulate their anti-slavery stance. You can imagine what light that put them in. P.R. Reitzman of Limestone, Tennessee, uh, who later founded uh, the, the Brethren Insurance Agent, Agency, the Mutual Aid Association after the war, uh, he wrote that Confederates came to steal his crops and his horses. He was sure they meant to kill them. I mean, he, I'm sorry, he was sure they meant to kill him. So he stepped into the stable and prayed, and here's what he prayed. Dear Father, save me from these men. Have mercy upon them and turn them back from their evil course and save thy servant. When he stepped back out, he says, I felt that God had answered my prayer, for I could see their satanic look of their faces disappear like the shadow of a cloud before the bright sunlight. The soldiers then said to me, and these are the soldiers that are stealing his horses and his crops, Mr. Reitzman, they knew his name, can we get some bread? Oh, yes, said I. We are commanded to feed the hungry. I, at once, I went at once to the kitchen and requested my sisters to cut off a large slice of bread and butter it for each of them. They did so, and I took it out to the yard and handed a slice to each. They thanked me for the bread, bowed their heads, mounted their horses, and rode away, taking my last horse with them. Feeling sure that the Lord had saved my life, I felt happy, thanked God, and, take, and took courage. Take courage. If there is, hor if there is hope, for horse thieves, there's hope for politicians. Change the world by changing the game. Be the soul of the nation. Be the soul of the community. Pray with thanksgiving and hope for everybody. Amen. Now I invite us all to share in our next hymn, which is Wonderful Grace of Jesus, and it is certainly wonderful grace. I'm going to rise and invite you, if it is comfortable, to rise for this hymn as well.
like in the conference. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Well, this is the time we recognize your offerings. A couple of months ago, Jenny and I headed to Silver City, New Mexico, which is uh, where my family, both sides of my family, settled uh, after crossing the border in 1910. Uh, anyway, I had, we had dinner with my 90-year-old uh, Aunt Isabel, as well as my uh, cousins Eva and Alan and their spouses. Uh, Alan is a retired high school principal, and he's a couple years older than me. Uh, he told me stories that caught me up short about the period when we lived in what my brother and I called the dirty house in Los Angeles. Now, it wasn't dirty at all. My mother was a great housekeeper. It was just old. We moved around a lot in those days because we were a Navy family. It was at a time when we were three and four years old, the two of us, and our father, who was a, petty, a chief petty officer in the Navy, was overseas on a cruise. Now, I had remembered, I had not remembered, that Alan and his family lived just down the street. And I was surprised that his memory of those times was that he could always come to our house and get a cookie from mom. Whereas I knew my mother is both loving and a little strict when it came to doling out treats. Uh, it makes me laugh to think about it. You see, mom had managed a household and feed a family on next to no money so that she had to set boundaries. But she also recognized that some people were in worse straits and she needed to be generous. This caused me to think of how God treats us differently. Some of us need more limits. Some of us need a surprise. And some of us need a whole lot more love than others. Some of us just know God in a radically different way from the other people we run into. In the same way, our lives of thanksgiving, gratitude, and offering are sometimes very different from what others experience, for, for better or for worse. So help us to celebrate with both surprise and appreciation the many ways in which you are known and to appreciate as well the many ways we respond in giving to the work of your kingdom. We are one people sh sharing different experiences of living and of giving. And uh, with gratitude we pray, therefore. Amen. This time we have a song of praise and worship.
be seated. Um, we're going to pray our unison prayer um, for our prayer focus, which is community. But before we do that, I was just informed uh, that when it comes to praying for our community, the Church of God on County Road 7 is on fire. And oh my. There is, uh, so I'm sure that there are uh, emergency crews and everything there right now. But let's begin right with, with a prayer, prayer for our brothers and sisters there. That's a wonderful church and wonderful people. Amen. So let's just begin right now. Dear God, you know all things, and we know almost nothing about what is happening to our, our neighbors, our sisters and brothers in, in you. Uh, and we just pray that you are keeping people safe, that, that uh, all are well and are escaping through the fire. We are praying that, you're, uh, that you are preserving our first responders and that they are able to do their work and that, that you are indeed giving them wisdom as they go about their task. Uh, we, we pray knowing that there, there have been a series of arson fires in our community and we pray with, if, if, that if this was deliberately set, which we don't know, that uh, you're, you will enter into the heart of whoever is behind this uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We believe in your power to change, to redeem, and to bless. But our first concern just remains that uh, you, will, you will bless all those who, who are involved, who are in danger, that, who, who need your presence. Uh, help us to know what it is we can do and how we can be of help to others. Yes, and gracious God, these things we pray in your mighty name as one people, lifting up, because we know not what else to say, the words which uh, your Son and our Savior taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm sure we'll all learn more soon. Um, but we, I think praying for our community is always important, and we have a tendency to define our community either in such broad terms that we fail to see the faces of real people or in such narrow terms that we fail to open our hearts to mm -hmm. the whole world. So we're going to pray a prayer at, in unison right now, uh, which will be up there on our... Um, there, there we go. So, um, yeah, let's, let's pray together. We come before you as members of a community. Sometimes that community is tightly defined by boundaries, allegiances, and the team we root for. Sometimes our community has a broader definition, or perhaps even no definition at all. We pray together now for our communities, not as individuals who are superior to or set apart from the people who surround us close at hand and around the globe, but as caring members of one body. We lift up the welfare and well-being of those who struggle economically who experience the same circumstances as us through a different lens, who feel ignored or lost or forgotten. We lift up those who feel secure, safe, healthy and blessed, thankful for their situation and praying that all may come to feel not only your love and care, but the love and care of the communities in which we dwell. Reveal in our hearts what it is we ourselves may do as a blessing for others and for all. Help us to identify 
what we must leave in your hands for now. Bless us as a community of faith and as a community here upon the earth as well. This we pray together. Amen. Now for our benediction. Send us forward, God who leads us. Go forward, people of faith. Amen.